about news in the TV or Times Now or Republic TV, people have two ways you look at the news. One is you are so excited to look at what is a nine o'clock debate. And for some people, there is no excitement. They're apathetic. Oh, whatever happens, I'm not bothered about it. I don't want to waste my time over it. And likewise, when we talk about the end times, people have two different views towards end times. One is an apathy, lack of interest. Oh, I, there are so many views and so many people are talking about this. But I just want to live a quiet Christian life and not be much bothered about it. That's one view of the church. We are not much bothered about all what is happening about the Bible's prophecy about the end times. But on the other extreme is excitement. Some people get too excited about this and they want to predict the times and the seasons and they get excited about the world events and the world personalities. There are preachers who get you excited about this and every political change, every advance of an army or every war or rumors of war is interpreted as some aspect or even from the scripture and arouse our interests. And in the end, they will also send you your, their banking details to do more research. And in the process, they become more rich. So we have church having two views on it. On one side, they're not bothered. On the other side, they're too excited. And people are very carried away by this concept of the second coming and the end times. Well, today we are going to look at what Jesus spoke about. The end times. What was Jesus really saying about the end times? Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is called as the Olivet Discourse of our Lord Jesus Christ because he sat on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples and uh, this discourse is called as the Olivet Discourse or the end time discourse of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this passage predominantly talks about the judgment of the religious establishment of Jesus' day called as the temple in Jerusalem. And he also talks another aspect about the end time, his coming again into this world. So, uh, and in the process, Jesus is also telling us, what does Jesus want me to do in the midst of a difficult world? Because the way Jesus is narrating the end times is going to be a very difficult time in this world. Okay, and how Jesus wants us to live in this end time and how we are going to live in a world that is absolutely out of human control, out of control of ordinary human beings. Now, to give you a context of this, Matthew presents his gospel. Matthew is writing predominantly to the Jewish Christians. And he has written it post AD 70, post the destruction of the temple that Herod beautified. And Matthew writes this gospel uh, to present that Jesus is the king of the Jews. He's the Messiah. And look at how beautifully he presents Jesus' birth and those narratives when the wise men come and bow down before him. Matthew is presenting that here's somebody who is a great king of this world, the Messiah who has come into this world. And then you come to Matthew chapter 4 and the following verses you can find that Matthew presents Jesus as establishing the kingdom of God. And the way one enters the kingdom of God is by repentance. You need to know that you're not good enough. You need to repent of your sins and then you are given entrance into the kingdom of God. And then Matthew goes and shows us some uh, works of Jesus that shows the signs, the wonders, the miracles that the kingdom of God is already here in the ministry of Jesus the dead rising the sea coming down at the command of Jesus and the demons fleeing and it's a sign a pre-sign that yes the kingdom is here something unnatural is happening in this place and what was Matthew doing? Matthew was talking to the religious who's who of Jerusalem, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and telling them that the kingdom is here. I am your Messiah. And the way you approach the kingdom of God is not a violent way against the Roman oppressors against Jerusalem now, but to take the pathway of peace to those people. But they kept on rejecting Jesus Christ. They kept on rejecting, finding ways to avoid him and even assassinate assassinate him the time has come for Jesus to be glorified and we come to the passion passages of Jesus he's anointed there at Bethany in Simon's house preparing him for his 
death and burial and resurrection. And then Jesus gets into the city of Jerusalem on a cold in a humble way. And people recognize him as the king. Hosanna. And what does Jesus do? He goes into the temple and overturns the money changers. Giving them one last prophetic a symbol that he is a new prophet and he is their Messiah. That at least now with all this, these people will realize that they were waiting for centuries for their Messiah. And here is the fulfillment of the prophecy that the Messiah is over here. And Jesus spoke some parables. Parabolically, he spoke about the kingdom and he spoke about what happens to the people who reject the kingdom of God. But nothing was getting into the head of this uh, so-called Pharisees and Sadducees and the other elite groups of the Jewish people. And wholesale, they're rejecting Jesus. And now they have come to a point that they want Jesus to get away with Jesus. They want to kill Jesus and finding a way to assassinate Jesus. So that's the scenario. So when you come to the end of Matthew chapter 23, this is the Passion Week and it's verse 37. Jesus is filled with grief and he's telling Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Oh Jerusalem, I am like a mother hen. I want to gather you and I want to give you a safe passage into your future and the way that you are dealing with the Romans the zealots the fights the insurrections against the Roman people that's not the pathway of the kingdom of God I'm going to give you the pathway of peace my way is different why don't you understand I want to gather you and I, my intention is to protect you like the mother hen but you would still not listen to me and Jesus says in verse 38 look because of that your house is left to you desolate you're going to be isolated abandoned and you're going to have a bad future because you are neglecting me because I am your Messiah I'm your creator God come in flesh verse 39 for I tell you you will not see me again I'm giving you one life final chance but time is coming I'm going to be glorified and you cannot see me again until you say blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord so Jesus says you are not willing so I'm going away, but because of your disobedience, you're not believing in me that I am your Messiah. You're going to face desolation, isolation, destruction, and he's very pained about it. Come with me with this background to Matthew chapter 24 and his verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples. So he left the temple one last time. He's leaving the temple courts, the epitome of Jewish religion. And Jewish celebrations. He leaves the temple. When his disciples came up to him. To call his attention to the building. So the disciples were very marveled. At the temple architecture. Remember this is the second temple. Uh, first uh, built by Solomon. And then later built. Uh, after the destruction of Solomon's temple. Later built. Uh, then uh, uh, by the help of Cyrus. And then. This is the second temple which is beautified for the last couple of years, maybe decades, by Herod. He spent enough and more money spending decades in beautifying this marble structure. And this Jewish temple is one of the most wonders of the ancient world and one of the most magnificent buildings of the ancient world. We don't find it in non-Jewish writings or Roman writings because of the anti-Semitism. But frankly speaking, in the entire Roman world, there was no structure like the temple mount and the temple structure. And it was huge courts and a lot of architecture. The buildings are huge. And even if you go to... To the promised land now you can find those blocks of stones that are so huge compared to a human being being lying in ruin in the other side of the temple mount so they paid so much of attention to the temple mount the beauty of the architecture of the temple and they were asking jesus about the temple about the building verse 2 says jesus said do you see all these things truly i tell you not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Selling, so look at that marvel of that beauty of the temple. I'm sad to say that because those people rejected me, every item of this temple is going to be overturned and is going to be destroyed. The temple was the Jewish national monument, national cathedral, 
and the national treasury all in one building and it was a matter of pride for them and jesus said that temple will be destroyed come to verse 3 matthew 24 verse 3 as jesus was sitting on mount of olives his disciples came to him privately now it's a private time between jesus and his disciples they walk out of the city of jerusalem sit on the mount of olives and the position is such a way that from the mount of olives you have a clear picture of the temple and the temple mount so they sit with jesus privately look at the temple right in front of them tell us they said when will this happen when will that destruction happen what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age so now how many questions are uh, Jesus' disciples asking Jesus? How many questions? Two questions, right? When will the temple be destroyed? Question number one. Number two, they're talking about some other event. When is the coming of Jesus Christ? Or when is the end of the age? Okay? So two questions the disciples ask Jesus. And thankfully, this time, Jesus answers both those questions. So that we have some information over here from Matthew. He answers both those questions. When the temple will be destroyed and when is the end of the times. So the fall of Jerusalem or the destruction of the temple of, at Jerusalem is mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 verse 4 through 35. Okay. From 4 to 35, Jesus' discourse is just about the destruction of the temple. And what does Jesus do? Jesus gives a definite timeline. Okay, now we are somewhere in AD 30, 31, 32, 33 uh, AD in the time of Jesus. And Jesus talking to his disciples about the destruction of the temple that is ahead of him. And he says that I'm going to give you a definite timeline. My prophecy is going to be accurate about the destruction of the temple. Come with me to Matthew chapter 24 verse 34 to 35. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. In other words, the destruction of the temple will happen in this generation. According to the Jewish culture, how many years is one generation? 40 years is one generation. And when is Jesus speaking this? Somewhere around AD 30. Okay? And according to history, when was the de temple destroyed there in Jerusalem? AD 70, the Romans march with the general Titus and they destroy the temple completely. AD 70, around 40 years. Jesus' prophecy regarding the destruction of the temple was accurate. One generation, the generation that saw Jesus, they saw the destruction of the temple. It all fulfilled in the time of Jesus, right? So accurate prophecy. But the, regarding the second time, second question, what is the sign of the end days? And what is the sign of your coming? It mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 to 51. You can go home and read that. 35 to 51 and Jesus says I'm not putting a deadline for that day there is no time I'm going to give but I'm going to come back there is going to be an end of the age right but I'm not going to give you a time and it's mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 but about the day or the hour no one knows so second coming nobody knows destruction of the temple accurately Jesus said but second coming Jesus said nobody knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son not even I know but only the father it's going to happen but it is going to be a coming like a thief and only known to my father now listen to me Matthew's context Matthew is writing this post 70 scenario the temple has been destroyed so what is Matthew writing to the audience who is reading him Okay, imagine the first century audience who is listening to Matthew. He is telling that, look, when disciples asked Jesus two questions. One was the destruction of the temple and the second was the end of the ages and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you look what happened. Just after one generation, around 40 years, the temple was destroyed. His prophecy was so accurate that there was no doubting his prophecy. And Matthew says to his readers, if his mention and prophecy regarding the destruction of the temple is accurate and it happened, even Jesus' prophecy regarding the end times, there is no doubt that it will happen and it will happen exactly like Jesus said it. So be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no doubt that 
Jesus will come back again. He is going to come back one day. Only thing the church has to be ready for this coming. Because all his prophecies have been fulfilled. And this prophecy will be fulfilled. Can I hear an amen church if you believe that? Amen. That's Matthew's intention. That prophecy has been fulfilled. Now this prophecy also will be fulfilled. But what is Matthew giving us? He is giving us two stories in one account. One is the story of the destruction of the temple. And the second is the story of the coming of Jesus Christ. The prophetic utterances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought that when you drive from, off from Mysore. And you get into the Gundalpet area and go to Uti. I don't know how many of you have gone to Uti. Beautiful scenery. You will find in Gundalpet and that area. A lot of hilly ranges. And one among those huge hill is Uti or Kunur. Further to that. And when you travel from Mysore and Bandipur and go near those hilly ranges, all those hills look so close to each other. They look so near. But only when you reach that Gundalpet and when you, when you travel through those valleys and the small hills in the travel, then you realize the distance between the smaller hill and the real destination of Uti is way long than what we could see over here. So when we read this passage from the eyes of Matthew, it may look that the coming of Jesus and the destruction of the temple is very imminent. But only when we understand and go through the times, we understand that this is a different hill and the second coming is a different hill. We cannot mix these two together. And the problem with the church today is this both these are mixed up. And the church and those kind of teachings are in an absolute mess because they try to bring some fiction into the second coming of Jesus Christ because the Bible is not a fictional story. It is a real narrative and the prophecy about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me church this morning? Amen. If you feel that the second coming story is becoming very fictional, that is not the right interpretation of the scripture. It is, has to be very real. And Jesus is explaining to us without any doubt about his second coming over here. So we know that the temple was destroyed in AD 66. The Jews rebelled against the Roman masters. And Israel was under the Roman occupation at the time of Jesus. And thereafter, an emperor Nero dispatched an army under the generalship of Vespasian to restore order. By AD 68, what happens is that resistance in the northern parts of the promised land had been eradicated and Romans turned all their attention to the Jerusalem and to the temple because there was the maximum re resistance uh, against the Romans because that's the temple over there. But that same year in AD 68, Nero died. The general, the emperor Nero died, who was heading this insurrection against attacking the Jews. He died, creating a power vacuum in Rome. So what happened? Vespasian, who was general, leading the insurrection against the Jews, he was called back to Rome to take over the emperor. So he became the emperor and then he appoints Titus. Uh, and uh, as the general to take care about the Jewish insurrections and Jewish opposition. And in AD 70, Titus took and his army took full control over the city of Jerusalem and squeezed it out of life and supplies. And Jerusalem surrendered and they came into the temple and destroyed the temple brick by brick, just like Jesus had prophesied it. People who were left were massacred. They were killed by the sword. People who fleed, they were sent to the mines in Egypt for the Romans to work as slaves for them. And people felt it like the end of the world. Slaughter everywhere, the temple has been destroyed. And the Jewish people felt that there is no hope and it was the end of the world for him. What you see over here is a monument in your screen of Titus. Because he did this against the Jewish people, there's a monument that is erected. Over there, honoring Titus and his work that brought the Jerusalem and the city of God and the temple down. And the very next picture I want to talk to you about, see, see, what, this is what they did. They came to the temple 
And in that monument, it shows about how um, Titus conquered and brought down the temple. Look at that menorah, the lampstand has been taken away from the temple. Look at the Ark of the Covenant being taken. Look at all that things being taken. The holy things of the temple were taken and displayed in the, in the museums and was mocked by the people because they could defeat Jerusalem and the temple and they made a mockery out of it. They took people to the sanctuaries where people were butchered and, and people were made fun of and people were slaughtered wholesale. And it was a very difficult time for the Jewish people, AD 70. And Jesus gives explanation of this in AD 30s. Come with me to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 to 21. Matthew 24, verse 15 to 21. Just read it as what Jesus prophesied regarding AD 70, the destruction of the temple. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. In other words, these people going and slaughtering the priests and the non-Jewish people getting into the holy place. That is the abomination of the desolation. Spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then those who are left in the Judea flee to the mountains. So what is Jesus advice to the Jewish people? When that day happens because you rejected me as a Messiah? Flee. Not about the future days now. In AD 70. Run away from Jerusalem. Why? Why did Jesus advise that? Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. In Jesus' time, their houses were having terrace and they had outside staircase, not from inside like what we see today. And they said, if, if the army is coming to destroy Jerusalem, don't come out of the house from the top and get into the house to take your passport and your certificates and belongings. Just run away because you're going to die under the Roman soldiers. Don't come inside. Go run. Verse 18. Let no one in the field go back to their cloak. If you are in the field, early morning would be very cold in Jerusalem. So they would come with an outer cloak. Around 10 o'clock when they break for tea, they would put their outer cloak somewhere outside the field and they get back to work. And if they hear that the Romans are coming, the temple is being destroyed, don't even go back to take the cloak. Run to the mountains. Run for your life, said Jesus in AD 70. This is what's going to happen. And verse 19, how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Do you know how difficult it will be for a pregnant woman to flee? Such a disaster and siege of Jerusalem. And Jesus was compassionate about the pregnant woman. And the nursing mothers, finding that they will not find it easy to live and they will be slaughtered. Verse 20, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or in the Sabbaths. In winter, you could not even walk and cross the rivers. It was so cold. And even though he pronounced judgment, there is a compassion over there. And he's saying, pray that, that when the temple is destroyed, it's not in winter or on Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now. And never to be equaled again. There is going to be something like that for the Jewish history. That all your history back and all your history forward, there is nothing going to happen like this. It is about the temple and destruction. And when we read about it and give interpretation to the second coming, it is a wrong interpretation, wrong way to look at it. We mix up a lot of things and make Jesus coming very fictional. Come to verse 22 to 25. If these days had not been cut short, the days of siege, no one would survive. No Jews would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. There are still elect in Jerusalem. There are the church in Jerusalem. And because of my people, the church in Jerusalem, then I will make sure that people are getting a safety out of this. And it says, verse 23, at that time, if anyone says, look, here is the Messiah or there he is, do not believe it. In AD 70, when this destruction happens, people will rise up in the church and say, oh, I have got a revelation that Jesus Christ has come back again. Because the destruction like world war is happening against Israel. Don't believe that. Jesus has not come. And do you know that post the destruction of the temple, many church believers prophesied and told that we are already in the kingdom. Jesus has come back again. 
And then Jesus warned that don't believe such sayings. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the elect. They may even rise up from the church talking about the first century and they will deceive you. See that I have told you ahead of time. Look at Jesus' prophecy. He's talking something regarding his time, AD 70, the destruction of the temple, the church and the people over there. And it is like going from Mysore and looking at all those hills. When we see that, we also see a picture and a shadow of the church today. Things are happening the same way over here. There are people who are coming and deceiving the church. We can find that shadow over there. But this was exactly about the destruction of the temple. And how Jesus quoted the Old Testament regarding the day of the destruction of the temple. Chapter 24, verse 29 to 31. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. Okay. About which time Jesus is talking this? AD 70. After that, did the sun come out? Do we have sun today? Yes. So it is a picture to tell us how the day of the destruction of Jerusalem will be. Not a literal thing. It's a poetry. See the poetry there. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And look at that verse, verse 29 of Matthew chapter 24. You have a footnote in your Bible. What is the footnote telling you? It is taken from a poetry from Isaiah. Right? Is, you see the footnote? What is it telling? It is from which chapter of Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 13. Are you with me? Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 13. And let us see what is Isaiah prophesying. And what is Jesus prophesying? Okay? Now what is Isaiah prophesying? Isaiah is prophesying post uh, the fall of the first temple. Okay? And he's talking the Babylonians have come and destroyed the temple. And he's prophesying to the Babylonians and to his people that God is going to destroy the Babylonians in a very, very significant way. Because just like the Romans or the Jewish people, the Babylonians are also rejecting God. And they are proud and God is going to destroy them. Some around 539 BC. And look at how Isaiah uh, picturizes the destruction of the Babylonians. Listen, verse chapter 13 and this verse 10 onwards. The stars of heaven and their constellation will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And you go home and read that. So what is Isaiah telling? Isaiah is telling that you know that Babylon is one of the top countries of the then world, 539 BC. And when God is going to judge Babylon, it is like a world event that everybody will say that the sun is coming down, the stars are coming down, moon is not going to give light. It is a picturized way of telling about the destruction of Babylon. But after that, 539 BC, did the sun come out? Yes, yes. Are there stars in the sky? Yes. So Jesus is telling and taking the same picture for Israel. You have become a new Babylon. You have rejected me. So because you have rejected me, I am borrowing the song of Isaiah and it will be like that day, the end of the world for you. That it will be like the sun showing no light. Moon is having no brightness. The stars are falling. But today, even in 2022, we can see a bright sun outside. The stars are there up in the sky. So when we tell that, okay, these are the signs that are going to happen and the moon is becoming red and the prophecies come out, please do not give your ears to that. That is the, not the right way to interpret end time passages and this kind of passages that Jesus has spoken and Paul has spoken later. Are you with me, church? Am I confusing you or are you with me? So Jesus says, it will be like the end of the world for Israel. But that is not the end of the world. The end is still to come. So in the first passage, Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it happened. And now Matthew tells the readers that if Jerusalem has been destroyed, it is 100% sure that the second prophecy, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, will be fulfilled 
and it is going to be fulfilled in the near future. And then Jesus goes on to talk, according to Matthew, some signs of the end age, the ages of the end. Now, do you know that every generation tells that now is the end time. Jesus will come in my generation looking at the coronavirus. Do you know that people living in the world war said the same thing? They saw all that and they said, oh, now the end is going to come. Do you remember Y2K? Y2K? Everybody said, this is the end of the world. Even in Nebuchadnezzar or the Babylonian destruction time, the whole world said, this is the end of the world. So every generation feels it. Why? Because that's the kind of evil world that we are living in, the wicked world that we are living in. And everything that happen over here makes us believe in our generation that this is the end of the world. But these are all signs of the ends of the world. So Jesus gives us signs of the end of the age. By the way, when is the end of the age? When is the end of the age? Are we waiting for it? I would say from the time Jesus came, or Jesus resurrected until his second coming. This time frame is called as the end, last days and, and the end of the world, right? You look at what Peter prophesied in the last days, your sons and daughters will prophesy. The last days began with the coming of Jesus or the coming of the Pentecost. And this last days continue until the second public coming of the Lord Jesus Christ where? Not anywhere into this world that we are living in. He is coming. And this period of time is called as the last days or the church age. Okay. It is also called as the church. Church was formed on the day of Pentecost. And the church will be there and will continue till the coming of Christ and thereon. And this is called as the church age or the last days. Okay. Now, what are the some of the signs of the end times? To know that we are in the end times and Jesus is going to come back soon. Jesus says there, verse 4 and 5. Jesus answered, watch out. Who has to watch out? The church has to watch out. That no one deceives you. There are chances that we can be deceived about these days and the end times. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Right after the resurrection of Jesus, many have come even during the fall of Jerusalem. If you read church history, I was going through many documents the last couple of weeks to preach this. In the first century, in the second century, third century, many people have risen and they have told that I am the Messiah. I have come as Jesus. And does it happen in our generation? People claiming in different parts of the world that I am Jesus. So this is a sign. Of the end times. Right? It happened in all generations from AD 1. Okay? This is a sign uh, of the end age. Deception from within the church at end times. So we need to be very careful. Even with church. Like the Bereans. We need to evaluate every preaching. Every prophecy. Every teaching. With the word of God. Don't just blindly buy everything. What preachers tell you. Because Jesus says. That at the end of the age, deception will happen from the church. So you need to be careful about the church. Okay? There are so many churches. Praise God for that. But we at the pew should be mature enough to know what is right, what is wrong and discern. Otherwise, who will be deceived? We will be deceived. Right? So deception. False prophets. And what do they do? They kind of hype up. They kind of talk about prosperity and grace and blessings. At the end of the day, they have mansions and they have, uh, they have money at the cost of the poor man and deceiving the poor man in the church. And that's the sign of the last days. I will talk to you as we are moving. Secondly, evil happenings in the world. Talks about in chapter 24, verse 6 and 7. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Okay, now, Jesus is telling this as a sign. Was there war before the coming of Jesus in this world? Yes or no? Tell me friends. Yes. Was there war in Moses' time? Was there war in Abraham's time? So Jesus says, this is the condition of the evil world. There will be wars. Are there wars today? Yes. Wars and rumors of war. So you don't have to be overly worried about that war of Russia and that Iran and Israel. Please don't get into all that. It will misguide us, deceive us. 
wars and rumors of wars but to see see to it that you are not alarmed so when somebody comes with a prophecy that okay uh, the army is coming from russia he's got so much of army the jesus has very clearly told don't be alarmed don't even listen to that it's not biblical right so that is a sign such things must happen it should happen but is it the end is the very end no the end is still to come verse six such things must happen but the end is still to come matthew chapter 24 verse six yeah uh, the end is still to come nation will rise against nation verse seven and kingdom against kingdom there will be famines and earthquakes in various places and all these are beginning of birth pains so what happens see look what jesus is telling us there will be wars there will be famines like what happened before there will be famines and earthquakes like what happened before but after my ascension if these things happen know that these problems are beginning of birth pains now we know that we thank god for our mothers who labor hard to deliver a baby into this world and you know it's very painful if you have ever been near a labor ward or or been with your wife as she delivered a child hours of pain normal delivery hours of pain and hours of agony unpredictable we do not know the time when the baby will come out and suddenly the birth pains will give rise to a new life and that sorrow is gone that crying mother will turn into joy everybody around will turn into joy and jesus says all that the church goes through and the world is going through now these are like the birth pains why because a new life is coming at the coming of jesus it is going to be a joy for mankind joy for his people everything is going to be renewed like a newborn baby coming into this world these are all birth pains but don't worry don't be alarmed the new life is coming at the coming of the lord jesus christ are you with me church amen the jesus describes the world as a woman in labor world as painful the world now is not a good place it is full of wickedness and evil and betrayal but hold on these are the birth pains the life is coming when jesus comes back again for the second time amen no more sorrow it's only life and joy so how the disciples will be treated so if you are a disciple of jesus christ you need to know how you and i will be treated in this end times right from his resurrection the coming of the pentecost this is happened then happened before after that and it's happening now how we will be treated come to matthew chapter 24 verse 9 to 13 expect how you need to be treated in the kingdom of our god before the coming of christ then you will be handed over to be persecuted to put to death did it happen in acts of the apostles yes or no yes or no yes is it happening today yes did it happen last week absolutely you heard reports right about the persecution in india so you should be expecting persecution you should be expecting troubles as a disciple of jesus who said that you come to christ and everything is fine jesus never gave such a gospel in the end times you are a disciple of jesus you expect trials birth pains painful difficulty persecution they will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me don't think that you will be a child of god and accepted by the world no there is a cost to be a disciple of jesus and you need to weigh your cost before you take up the decision to follow jesus it's not popular to be a disciple of jesus you will go through persecution you will go through hatredness jesus promised that verse 10 at that time many will turn away from their faith and will betray and hate each other where in the church is it not surprising that in many churches including ours after the pandemic many people don't want to come back to church where is their faith they are settling down for online church they don't want to have a connections with a real pastor real believers who have got problems no i don't want to such a christianity for me sunday morning if i on the tv that is enough jesus said that 
I'm not talking about those who are online now. For some reason you are worshipping online. Or you have a church different that you attend. For resources you come to City Harvest. I'm not talking about such people. Right? But I'm talking about those people who do not want anything to do with church. Don't want anything to do with community. I will stay home because the church is not good. Who said the church is good? We are all fallen people. We are living in the end days. But we learn to love one another. We learn to love God. We Together we learn to love the community. And we practice. But in the end times, Jesus said, it's not surprising that many, many, many people get baptized. And baptism numbers are high. And we project our baptism numbers. But they walk back through the back door. Never come to church again. Why? Because discipleship has not gotten. They have not been told what is lordship. And what is discipleship. To be a follower of Christ. It costs us something. I know nobody will say amen to that. Jesus said that. And many false prophets will appear. And deceive many people. Whose voices are you listening to? Are you running after prophets? I'm not nullifying the role of a prophet. But be very careful. Because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end. Will be saved. So who said there is no persecution? Pastor after coming to church. After taking baptism. I'm having a tough time. So I thought I will not come to church anymore. I will not follow Jesus. The person who shared the gospel with you did not share a right gospel. Because look at Matthew, how he's building up to this last days. He's building up in his gospel. Read the gospel of Matthew properly. We have gone through this journey, right? Matthew chapter 5 verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He has been building his readers. If you are a true disciple and read Matthew properly, you know he has prepared you well in advance that this is going to be the kind of life in this world in the last days. Matthew chapter 10 verse 16 to 20. I am sending you like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes, as, as an innocent as doves. Be on your guard. So you will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. How many of us will stand for Christ if you are taken to the magistrates? And if you have to get a jail sentence for being a follower of Jesus, how many of us will stand for Jesus today? Verse 19, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what you will say or how you say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Jesus told this already. We won't receive rest from our sufferings until Jesus comes to destroy the wicked and publicly glorify saints when I'm talking about sufferings I'm not telling that only suffering I am blessed I have everything that I need God has blessed me with good family food for my table a house to live a car to drive but that does not mean that I'm only after those blessings God has given me blessings but I cannot nullify that if I'm a follower of Jesus I will not go through sufferings there is no promise like that. There is no gospel like that. See Paul. Paul also takes this illusions from Jesus' prophecy. And his writings superbly complement. Matthew chapter 24. Superb compliments in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Paul is not going anywhere for his doctrine. He is deriving it out of the theology that Jesus gave, the prophecy that Jesus gave. 2 Thessalonians 1.5 All this is evidence that God's judgment is right and as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom. When we go through sufferings, when we go through pain, that job loss, that cancer situation is painful. We have lost many people for cancer. We have lost many people accidents. 
Last week, you know, there was an accident where the father and the two children got drowned, a pastor and his two children. And that wife is alive. And she's telling, Lord, after serving you, why should I see three dead bodies right in front of me? My husband was serving you. I am serving you. And Jesus says, as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God permits his elect to suffer with his concern that their suffering will not result in their spiritual ruin. That is he is concerned about. Suffering according to Jesus is a way for his disciples throughout the whole period between his resurrection and his coming. The church will go through sufferings. And look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Look, Peter's theology. What does Peter talk about it? All the uh, apostles have talked about it. James talks about it in his writings. But look at Peter, what he says. 1 Peter 2, 21. To this you are called. What is our calling? Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. So what is the step of Jesus? He walked into his cross. A pathway of suffering. So Jesus did not promise a suffering free life. So dear friends. We are living in the last days. Right from the ascension of Jesus. Till his second coming. He is coming anytime. We need to be prepared. For that Jesus to come tonight. We should be ready. But how should I be living? Instead of interpreting all those signs on the moon. And all those happenings in the Middle East. Don't worry about all that. That is excitement mode. Right? That is excitement mode. And then we are disinterested. That is also not the right way to live. But Jesus tells us in this passage, talking about the destruction of the temple, how we should be living in the last days. Come with me to Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 to 13. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. That's the age that we are living in. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stand firm. Stay put in Christ. No matter what happens, what never happens, stand firm. I'm not following Jesus. I'm not following a man. I'm not coming to church for a man. I'm not doing my Christian ethics and Christian living because of a man. Jesus has caught hold of me. I will stand firm. Till when? Till the end. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, stand firm to the end. Stand firm till the end. Endurance is the key. Are you going through certain challenges in your life where you feel like giving up? Giving up your prayer? Giving up on many things that you're doing? Christian disciplines that you're doing? And you feel like, oh, lost all hope? Jesus comes to us and speaks to us now. Stand firm. Hold on till the end. And then he says in chapter 24 verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world. As a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So what is our second duty as a disciple of Jesus? Bear witness to the good news of Jesus. Let me ask you. If you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ. You will be involved in the gospel work. Oh, pastor, how can I involve in the gospel work? Speak about Jesus, the gospel. Share the good news, the great commission. Every one of us have been given the Holy Spirit to share the gospel. So two things we need to be doing. Stand firm, but live for the gospel. Live for the gospel. Give your life for the gospel. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what God is expecting us to do. How many of us are involved in sharing the great commission? The love of Jesus, the passion of Christ, the death and the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus. We need to be sharing. It is foolishness to the world, but we have the power of God. Amen. Share the gospel. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, share the gospel. Amen. Use your money, your time, your resources for the gospel. Support gospel work. Support gospel. Men of God, missionaries of God, Bible translators. Be involved. Use your time, your resources, your everything for the sake of the gospel. Out of your love for Christ. Can I hear an amen, church? Amen. 
And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Talking about the second coming and the, and the resurrection of the bodies. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Same words Paul is using. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. You may be facing a physical problem. You may be facing a job problem, financial problem, family problem. Let nothing move you from Christ, the solid rock of our life. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Same words. So give yourself for the gospel. Give yourself for the great commission. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. A last passage I want to read and close. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 to 10. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God of which you are suffering. Verse 6. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. When he comes back, he is going to bring justice. And give relief to you who are troubled. Are you troubled today? Are you going through pain? Are you going through difficulty? Our relief is coming at the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because in this world, one problem is over. You just sit. In a couple of days, you know that the next challenge is coming up. But there is a day coming. A day of relief for all those who are suffering. And this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire. With his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God. And do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. And shut out from the presence of the Lord. From the glory of his might. On that day he comes to be glorified in his holy people. To be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you. Because you believed our testimony to you. Amen. His death, his resurrection means that the powerful forces of this evil around you will not always reign over you. One day in his coming, he will give us full victory, justice and wipe away our tears. And like the birth pain, the baby is going to be born. The kingdom is going to come. Jesus is going to come. And what a joy. What a day of rejoicing that will be when Jesus returns again for his bride, for his church.